Pixel Therapy is a member of the But Why Though Podcast Network. Go to butwhythopodcast.com for an inclusive geek community offering pop culture news, reviews, and podcasts. I think we have a kind of philosophy that's like, make them laugh, make them cry. <laughs> like, basically, like, we want to sell them on this, like, idea of absurdity and humor and then kind of, like, make them realize, oh, I really care about this raptor <laughs> and really feel for them at the end. Welcome to Pixel Therapy, the video game podcast where we look at the games we play through the lens of the player, where what you play is just as important as how you play it, and where emotional intelligence is a critical stat. Every other week, we bring on a guest who may or may not consider themselves a gamer to discuss the games that have made them and changed them, and all the feelings they have about our favorite pastime. I'm your co-host, Jamie, pronouns she, her. And I'm your co-host, Spencer, pronouns they, them. And this is Pixel Therapy. Folks, it is officially 2022. <laughs> what? 2020. That doesn't sound right. 2022? 2022. Numbers keep 2020, growing. 2022. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> we made it through another one, and uh, we are so excited to be back at the mic. So happy to be back at the mic with you in particular, Spencer. Thanks Aww. for being here. Same. Uh, <laughs> feel a little like nervous, kind of shaking off yeah. the cobwebs, coming I back from the, the holiday break. <laughs> This, the invisible stage jitters. <laughs> You're right. It's like, this is, we're not even doing this in front of everyone. And I'm like, ah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, why don't we get things started as we always do with our Patreon shout outs. Uh, this is our special thank you to everyone who subscribed at our Patreon name in the credits tier for the month of December. This month, we want to give some gratitude to Val, Genevieve, Lindsay, Grace, Jackie, Ben, and Cortland. Thank you all so much for continuing your dedicated support of our little podcast. Thank Remember, you. If you, lovely listener, want to get your name in the credits, you can hop on over to patreon.com slash pixel therapy pod, where you can subscribe for as low as $2 a month and get a monthly bonus episode of pixel therapy for your listening pleasure. And if you're a fan of what we do here on pixel therapy, please consider sharing us with your friends and family, rating and reviewing us on Apple podcasts, and even maybe sending us a little email at pixeltherapypod at gmail.com. Whether it's a question or a comment, we'd love to hear from you. That's it. Only a question or a comment, nothing else. I don't know. What else could they write in with? <laughs> Feedback? A story? A story? A game recommendation? A game recommendation? Well, I don't know. I can add all of that to this. <laughs> I just try to keep it brief. You know, uh, whatever you want to email us with, we would love to hear from you. Unless it's hate. In which case, yeah. you know, type the email out. It'll probably make you feel better. Like, you write it out. Absolutely. Mm. Get that out. Get that out of you. You don't and need to sit there it. with all of that anger. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, do the digital equivalent of burning it and just delete it. Don't actually send it to us because that's not, that's not nice. But definitely get it out of your system. Mm -hmm. I get that. I understand that. Love that for you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks. It's time to get cozy. Pull up an armchair. Feel free to lie down on the couch. Then let's talk about our feelings. Spencer? How are you doing? How was your holiday? Uh, I mean, they were good. Thanks in part to you. We spent Aww. New Year's together. That we was sure fun. did. It was really fun. It was a good time. <laughs> we played games. Wingspan. Wingspan. Oh my, gosh. oh my god. I'm a wingspan addict now. Can't so get enough wingspan. Can you tell the 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 people about wingspan and how it's not just a board game but also a game game? <laughs> it's also a game game. Um, it's a digital it's game. It's a digital game. I mean, <laughs> it's a you know, real game. Games and real games. <laughs> there's board games and real games. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, so Wingspan, I'm, I couldn't possibly do it justice uh, off the cuff like this, but essentially it is, it's called a, you know, the type of game that it is, if you're familiar with board games, it's both a strategy game and an engine building game. The premise of the game is that you are a sort of combination of bird watcher, nature enthusiast. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the the O word? Ornith ornith Orn ornithologist? Ornithologist. Yes, I think that's right. We're going to say that's right. Send us an email and tell us yes. if we're wrong. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> uh, but yeah, so you, uh, you're, you're somebody who takes care of and watches birds. And essentially, uh, the premise of the game is that you are drawing 
bird cards and playing bird cards and laying eggs uh, over the course of several rounds. I like the eggs. And trying to get the eggs are great, but <laughs> it, look up the wingspan board game because these little eggs, they look like candy and you just yeah, want to. Yeah, it's nom, a forbidden nom. snack for sure. <laughs> they would not taste good IRL because they're just little, little like, I don't know. I don't think it's plastic. This It's like a little, it probably is plastic, but it's it almost seems like it's like ceramic. It's yeah. like a little. It's very smooth. Ornate, smooth and little weighty. egg. Yeah, got a nice little weight to it. Heft. Anyway, uh, you're doing all these different things. You have goals that you're working towards, like have so many eggs laid on birds with this nest type, or yeah. um, have X number of birds in a particular um, habitat. So there's like different habitats, the forest and the grasslands and the wetlands. Um, it's a really cool game. All of the bird cards, there's 170 different birds featured in the game. Uh, my partner and I specifically have the the base game, which I believe is uh, focused on North American birds. Mm -hmm. And all of the birds have little bird facts. They all have special bird powers that align with uh, basically the type of bird that they are and, and how they exist in the world. Um, that's a really cool game. You learn a lot about birds. The artwork's really cool on the game. And I really like uh, the strategy. And, and it's a game that has a lot of different ways that you can win. So it's very adaptable. You you have to be kind of, you can come in with a strategy, but then you kind of have to be nimble about how you apply mm. it based on the cards you're able to pick up and, and what you're able to actually do. It's also a game that encourages you to like think cert, you know so many moves ahead. And I don't yeah. know. I just like it. Tickles my brain in the right way. I love how cute it is, how well designed it is, and uh, I, I like learning about birds. <laughs> I like learning all yeah. the bird facts. <laughs> but yeah, we played that a bunch when Spencer was here visiting. The best part about Wingspan, the board game, is that there's this little bird feeder that is made <laughs> out of like cardboard, and you put dice in the back of it, and then they come out the bottom, and then that it each die has different foods on it. And so you know what types of foods you can collect to feed your birds. And it's just like so delightful and fun to throw the dice in there and watch them come out the bottom. I just <laughs> thought it was added just one more level of whimsy that I really appreciated. Um, yeah. But I think I remembered when the game came out and it like took the board game world by storm. Like everybody I knew was talking about this game wingspan. Um, I don't know why I didn't pick it up. I think I was intimidated by it. There's like, like a slight, it, there's some setup, I would say. It takes yeah. a few minutes to set up and sort of yeah. wrap your head around the rules. But, um, I mean, once Jamie learned it and I had someone to teach <laughs> me that it was, like, an easy yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It definitely takes a couple plays to to really start to wrap your head around the engine building aspect of it. Um, but I think I would say that I'm a solidly, like, intermediate to, like, low, I don't know, whatever's in between intermediate and novice board mm. game player like kind of in that range um my partner and i don't play like the most complex board games but we uh you know we're big fans of C settlers of Catan, and we like something that's like definitely pushing us a bit more even than katana's mm. and i would say wingspan is definitely in terms of like the amount of strategy and rules and stuff that you have to understand is a couple steps probably beyond where katana is so i think if if you're someone who's looking to dive just a little bit deeper yeah. into the world of board games or to fly a little bit higher fly a little bit i like that yeah um <laughs> wings wingspan's a, a great get and i know i'm definitely behind the curve wingspan was like hot shit a few years ago how's but, the game um, the digital the video game version uh yeah so i also picked it up on switch i actually picked it up on switch first before we bought it and tried oh. to play the switch version and could not wrap my head around okay it. like yeah the tutorial was like so i was like I thought that if I got the digital version, mm. I could like test drive it basically to mm. see if I would like the board game. And I couldn't, I could, I couldn't even make it through the full tutorial of the digital version because I was just so confused by Yikes. the way they were laying the rules out and presenting them to me. That may have just been me, you know, I don't, I don't know. Maybe that would work mm. better for other people. I don't think it's you. But. <laughs> but after playing the board game, I went back to the digital version, now understanding the game and was able to very quickly get back into it. I think the digital version of the game is certainly serviceable. I'm mostly playing it against the computer. Mm. Um, I think it would probably be more fun to play against friends online, though. I don't know. I'm just not someone who generally wants to play against randos online, yeah. but you could. Um, so yeah, instead of playing against randos, I just play against the computer. I feel like it goes faster. Mm. Uh, 
I like it. I think it's pretty solid. The art, the art and stuff. I mean, I just prefer the tactile feel of the board game. I think like if mm-hmm. I had my druthers, I'd play the board game. But it's a nice uh, substitute if like nobody's available to play the board game with me, yeah. and I just really need to get a wingspan <laughs> fix. I can hop yeah. into the digital, um, you know, or you know, maybe one day down the road we can play the digital together across <gasps> the distance of the state of Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we played wingspan like five times over two days, so <laughs> it's definitely a fun one. And I, yeah, I agree. There's something about the 3D. Helps my brain wrap around all the different moving parts when there's mm-hmm. uh, objects and movement assigned to, e- assigned to each, and I can see it all in front mm-hmm. of me. Mm-hmm. Yep. What else did you get up to on your break? <laughs> well, okay. So there's this show. Okay. Well, it's funny because so this is series. It's it's a book series. It's uh, games. Oh, Tell and me now more. it's a TV show. It's called The Witcher. Oh, The Witcher? What's that all <laughs> What's about? That? <laughs> okay, I just think it's funny because I have a sworn <laughs> hatred of The Witcher no 3. The you got game. a big sign hanging on your front door. <laughs> I, yeah, no witchers allowed. I'm, I'm like the people in the world of The Witcher who don't like witchers. Anyway, sorry, I should explain. In the world of The Witcher, so originally book series by Andre Sapkowski, um, and now a show created by Lauren Schmidt Hisrick. Um, it's essentially set in this world. I believe it's referred to as the continent in the book series. But essentially, you play as a man. Or sorry, you play and and you watch a show about a man <laughs> named Geralt. He has white hair and golden eyes, and he is a badass who slays monsters. He's essentially been um, mutated through alchemy and magic and. Uh, ancient times plastic surgery to be ultra strong (laughs) and withstand magic and he can also cast a little bit of magic himself and he's basically placed in this world full of monsters and plots and all he wants is to just kind of like be left alone and get (laughs) his business done and make his coin and be about his way but the world is determined to not let that happen for him he is very charmingly portrayed by henry cavill in the new series um but essentially i was very upset about the witcher 3 the game which was very popular still is big ps4 ps5 title um and in that game uh again it's a fantasy world uh developer cd project red uh has come under some criticism for literally having not a single non-white person in the game and their response famously has been that it, because it's a fantasy world based uh, on Poland that like it's impossible for non-white people to exist um but it's possible for like magic and monsters like I just think it's yeah. interesting that there's some fantastical elements like those things didn't exist in Poland either but I guess they're fine to include anyway that's just <laughs> kind of what we can't possibly imagine is a world without with, only white people right so you know, there's that. Um, I tried watching this show season one in 2019 when it first came out. Um, I, like a lot of people, was sort of got thrown off by the amount of converging timelines. Mm, that was mm-hmm. there's just a lot going on. It's a lot of setup in that first season, and um, it just didn't really stick. And I think maybe I was also holding a little grudge in my heart again. I wasn't letting my heart be open to The Witcher this year. Um, Friends of mine have been very insistent that I give it another chance. Um, and so I've been watching the first season again and I've been really enjoying it. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to mention that because it's something that I've been doing over the holiday season. I just think that um, I'm reminded that um, this is this adaptation of the show is from the book series. So like Mm -hmm. the game really is not even canon um, according to the book's author. Uh, It's Mm -hmm. just sort of like another imagining uh, using the characters and some inspiration from the stories. Um, But I feel like um, just the difference in the way the characters are fleshed out and the motivations of the non-white male characters, like seeing that, uh, that being given much more, um, 
play and space versus the game um, and just the richness of the storytelling um, and the diversity of characters has really been mm-hmm. exciting for me. Um, I know you have been a fan since the beginning, Jamie, of the show. I don't know if you if there's anything you wanted to add about just overall. <laughs> no, I definitely uh, like the... I like the presentation of the show. I it, this might be sacrilege to say I did enjoy the mm. gameplay of the witch. Like I enjoyed, I played Witcher two and Witcher three. I didn't play Witcher one um, because I, this may no longer be true. But at the time that I played it, I don't think it was it was available on console. I think it might have mm. it might have been it might still be PC only. Um, so I played Witcher two on my at the time Xbox three sixty, and then I played Witcher three on PlayStation. And I enjoyed those games by and large. I enjoyed the lore, but I think there's plenty of critiques that you could hold to those games, especially the one that you've already named, which is the lack of characters of color. Um, Just not a very diverse world in general in those games in terms of um, modern standards of diversity, racial and gender diversity. Geralt's an interesting character, but in those games, uh, he definitely feels more distant I think mm. I just think there's a lot that the show has done to make the pull me more into the narrative. And I was always a little bit lost in the narrative anyway, having not played the first game. So while I didn't hate the Witcher games, I thought they were perfectly fine. I also wasn't someone who's out here like beating a drum for these being the best games that ever existed. Mm. And I really enjoy the show. I like what they've done with it. I was really surprised to hear that Henry Cavill got cast <laughs> initially <laughs> yeah. because he just didn't seem the type based on like the visioning of Geralt that I had had from the games, but he mm-hmm. really embodies the character in a great way. I think it's so cool that he's actually like somebody who plays video games and like mm-hmm. feels strongly about these characters and I really like what the show has done to bring in a more diverse cast and um I like where the story's at. My my partner and I watched the second season that just came out uh, in December, I think. The second mm-hmm. season dropped. So we just watched that over the holiday break and and really liked it and excited to see where it goes from here. And it's interesting to use the bit of the lore that I know from the games to kind of like fill in and be like, okay, well, now I think we're probably going to see this or that character. But mm. so far, by and large, I've liked the characterizations of everyone in the show more than I ever liked them in the game. And it's, it's gotten me interested in, I'm not a big reader, but possibly going back and checking out the books. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Like I, I do find that the show, um, and granted I'm still in season one, but I feel like there's the way that the, that time is sort of flexible. Like Geralt, um, he has an unnaturally long life and, uh, because of the experimentation and stuff that's been done on his body. And so in the books, there's like novels, but there's also like a bunch of short stories about the Witcher. And it's sort of, um, it's very episodic in the sense that you're kind of just dropping in on Geralt after certain stretches of time. Um, and I think the way the episodes are structured, it kind of does that too, where um, it doesn't feel like one continuous long narrative thread from episode to episode like I'd be used to from like a Game of Thrones for example um, but it's sort of more like it feels almost like quests like the way that it's structured and and, and that feels it, it, it that is reminiscent to me of sort of gameplay um, but not in a way that feels like kitschy or gimmicky like it just feels kind of fun and refreshing like a refreshing way to engage with these um um, stories like it really feels kind of like a fairy tale um and it has that sort of dark tragic undercurrent i think these stories mm. um and i and i feel like that comes through a, a bit more in the show than it does in the games yeah i i think definitely and i think you're you're bringing up something that I kind of forgot a bit from watching the first season so that's interesting because by the time we get to the second season it is telling a much more straightforward Mm. narrative in terms of the way time progresses throughout the second season. It's much more linear and we're seeing episodes uh, pick up on the story directly where the previous episode left off. So Mm. I think that's, that's a big shift that will come in the second season. But I also think that the action and the narrative gets much meatier because at the core of the Witcher story, it's, it's really about the, the three characters of, of Geralt, Yennefer and Ciri and kind of the found family that they create together, which was something that I really enjoyed from from Witcher 3. It's like when I think the most redeeming aspects of the narrative of that game. And so to see in the second season us, us finally 
reach the point where we're we're seeing that come together. I think that the first season is about it, you know, we're just laying all the breadcrumbs that are building us to that point. And I think they've set us up for the third season. We're actually going to get to see that family unit exist um, mm. as a, as a cohesive unit and tackling the apocalyptic things that are starting to happen in their world. So mm. it's, it's cool to watch that slow build towards that. Yeah. And those three main characters, girl, the witcher, Yennefer, a sorceress and yeah. person who has mysterious origins and Siri, who is a orphaned princess and mm-hmm. who has been um, sort of entrusted into Geralt's care um, due to uh, what's called the law of surprise in this world, uh, mm-hmm. a rule in which um, so Geralt essentially saved the life of Siri's father. And um, almost as in a joke, claims the law of surprise which is like a big cultural thing uh in the for this person who he's just saved where um the person who saves you in as in return for them saving your life you promise them the next uh thing that you come to obtain but that you don't know what it's going to be yet so it could be a house it could be the throne it could be a new jacket like you don't really know what it's going (laughs) to be um and so right after Geralt claims the law of surprise um the man he saved Drury learns that his wife is pregnant, and so Geralt essentially is uh, his his fate is becomes entwined with series. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's your Witcher lore for the day, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jamie. Speaking of just like video game TV show adaptations, um, you've also been into this series recently called Arcane. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, so the break was a great time for video games, but also a great time for like just binging. Just <laughs> shows. content. Just like yeah, just sitting on my couch, snuggled up with a blanket and the dogs and my partner and and watching good stuff. Um so during the break we also watched through all of Arcane. Um this is uh, also a Netflix series. It's an animated show. It just dropped this fall. Um, it's nine episodes, one season that are kind of broken up into uh, three. It's like a three part story. So three episodes at a time kind of focus on on one thing. And uh, it's set in the League of Legends fictional universe and features characters from the League of Legends games uh, or game. I personally am not a League of Legends fan at all. Never played the game. No next to nothing about it. Um, but just for a little bit of context, League is this, it's a huge, huge game. It's been around since 2009, um, and it still has a very active player base to, to this day. It's a, called a MOBA, which is a multiplayer online battle arena video game. So essentially you pick um, these different like hero fighter characters and then do battle against it's other very players. serious i know people who get there's like esports teams yeah. players making bank playing being really really yes. good at this game it's like one of those <laughs> yes and it's yeah it's got a very yeah very serious community you don't just dabble in no. league of legends i don't think like it's no, not no. like oh maybe i'll just jump into a game <laughs> Uh, uh, it's, yeah, not something you just, oh, just I'll just dip my toe in the waters. Uh, no. It it's requires, a lifestyle. It, yes, yes. Um, the game is developed and published by Riot Games. Um, the TV series is created by Christian Link and Alex Lee, and the animation is done by a French animation studio called Fortiche. The animation is like one of the first things that intrigued me about the show. Um, it's got a very cool steampunk style to it and it is incredibly detailed the the art of the game or sorry the art of the show is fantastic and i think the show would be worth watching for that alone it's it's one of my like just favorite animation styles i've seen very dark detailed the characters are all super hot so that's (laughs) something you're into Uh, you know it's definitely it's a little (laughs) bit horny this is a little horny uh if you want to get into that aspect of it The sound design is very, very cool, too. I just felt you can really feel because it's all steampunky. A lot of characters have a lot of um, intersecting pieces of metal and clockwork on them. Mm. Um, There's parts of the show where they're they're walking through um, 
areas that uh, have like wooden floors and things. I don't know. Just all the characters have a lot of weight to them and you can hear and feel them moving through the world Mm. in a way that I think is really, uh, it just really stood out to me um, for it, for an animated show. I've, everything felt very real and alive in that world. And I think the sound design was a big part of that. That's like a Um, game too. Yeah. I feel like (laughs) sound design and making your character feel like really immersing you in the world is like a very video game thing. Yeah. Um, 100%. Yeah. It reminds me of like the last of us and stuff, how you could really just every micro detail. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You can feel, you can hear the movement and it just makes it feel more real. So just the, the talent of all that alone was it would have been enough to get me through the show. But the story is is really, really fucking engaging. Um, for one thing, it's super character focused, uh, which I love. That's one of the main things that draws me to games and, and television shows, if I can get invested with the characters. And this is a show that has it has a unique world setting. It has a lot of lore, but it really doesn't spend a lot of time on those things. It introduces to ev- you to everything through the characters and their actions. So it's mm. much more grounded in the relationships between the characters. Um, there's a lot of narrative around both uh, found family and and related family and how you how to balance those things and the challenges that come with both. And there's themes around the limits of science and also whether or not technological advancement is Mm. the, both the damage and the positive that that can cause and how you can have the best of intentions and things can still really get out of your hand when corporate and political interests get involved. So there's a, there's a lot going on thematically. And yet at the end of the day, like what, what you're stuck with the most and what resonates the most is, is these interactions between characters. And it's a show where the characters themselves are constantly making decisions with the right intentions. And then things just don't go the way that they want them to. The, the setup of the world is that our character, our main characters that we focus on live in these two interconnected cities. There is Piltover, which is Mm. a very rich, wealthy, technologically advanced city that's seen over by this political council of rulers. And then there's what they call at the beginning of the show, the Undercity, that Mm. eventually goes by the name of Zahn. But you're introduced to it as the Undercity, which is literally underneath uh, Piltover. It is uh, the complete opposite of Piltover in so many ways. The people living there are considered lower class citizens. They are Mm. poor. It's uh, much uh, dirtier. City, it's dark and dank. It kind of looks like these people live in the sewers almost. It's got a very green pallor. Mm. Um, it's seen as like a criminal underbelly to the high class society city above. And the the folks at Piltover, even though they technically rule over the undercity, they don't give it any attention or mm. care. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, most of the attention is put on policing uh the undercity and keeping them out of Piltover. So you kind of have this this class system set up from the beginning that underscores the majority of the story. And then we follow a pair of characters in both the Undercity, um, our two main characters, which are Vi and Powder, which are sisters, young sisters who've been orphaned by a war that happens that we don't see that happens before the show starts in mm-hmm. which the Undercity rose up and tried to overtake Piltover and they were completely decimated in the course of this. So they lose their parents in that process. And then uh, we follow a couple of scientists in uh, Piltover, one of which came from the Undercity and wants to create technology to ultimately help the people living in the Undercity Mm. and kind of how that that goes awry and gets twisted into political interests. So Mm. a lot of big stuff happening in the (laughs) show, but it's all really anchored in these characters that we care a lot about. And... Yeah, man, I just can't say enough good stuff about this show. Go watch Arcane if you haven't watched it. If any of that sounds interesting, yeah. go watch this show. You don't have to have any affinity for League of Legends at all or know who any of those characters are. But that said, like if I was someone who played League of Legends and then I got this show to fill in the backstory of some of these characters that I had been playing as for mm. possibly a decade or more, that would mean so it would just mean so much. I have to imagine that folks who play League of Legends who care about these characters, um, who cared about these characters already coming in are just getting such a feast. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh of of lore and backstory that the League of Legends game doesn't really make space for. Like yeah. my understanding is that League of Legends doesn't really have a story to it 
or a story content. So you're getting basically a decade's worth of cutscenes <laughs> condensed into an animated show. But, and that's yeah. got to be really cool for them. And as someone who has no affinity for the game, I'm still like, this is awesome. I love it. I can't wait for season two. Unfortunately, they already said it's not coming out until post 2022. So I'm like Ugh. dying inside a little bit. But good show. I'm looking forward to the success of this series, meaning an open world narrative driven League of Legends game is <laughs> there coming you go. in the future. There you go. That would be <laughs> awesome. That I would be here for. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Spencer. Oh my gosh. We've been talking about games adjacent things. <laughs> but yeah. you and I have been playing a video game over the break. <sighs> a little video game called Tales of Arise. Hell yeah. Uh, Tell me about Tales of Arise. So I'm 60 hours in, so needless to say, this has consumed my life. Um, Okay, so Tales of Arise is a brand new game that's just, well, I mean, within the past couple months. um, Dropped September 2021. uh, September, it's not that long ago, but it feels like eons ago. Oh, yeah, no, it's like (laughs) seven years ago in September of 2021. Yeah, and uh, Arise was developed and published by... Bandai Namco, and it is the 17th game in the Tales of series. Um, it's a series of Japanese action role-playing games, um, and this game is available on Xbox, PlayStation, and PC. Um, and essentially, it is a sweeping, epic story um, centered on these two planets. So there is Dana, which is a medieval, um, very rudimentary society, uh, uh, you know, no magic users, um, and basically populated with a people that are oppressed by Renans who um, are from the planet of Rena, which sort of hovers in the sky above Dana, always present. And Rena is a very technologically advanced um, magic, techno-magical using society. Um, essentially, they, with their overwhelming knowledge and forces, have been colonizing and enslaving the population of Dana um, while essentially... Uh, harvesting what they call astral energy and uh, from these people and basically sucking it up into into Rena. Um, this astral energy is sort of this, you know, immutable force of the universe that permeates everything. Um, mm-hmm. Astral energy exists inside each one of us. It's like the stardust that makes up the universe. <laughs> yeah. um, and in order to uh, extract the energy from the Danon people. Um, the Renans basically put them through torture and work and um, even maybe poison them and, and do things to sort of ex- extract it from them through pain and emotion. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so in the midst of all this, a man uh, who has no memory of his past or even his name or face. Um, his whole head is encased in an iron mask. And so they call him iron mask. <laughs> um, <laughs> this character sort of pairs up with uh, a woman named Xion, who is Renan. Uh, we don't really know much about her past at the beginning of the game, only that um, she's never really been close to other people because she has this curse, uh, which I refer to as the thorns. And it's mm-hmm. this dark matter, dark thorny energy that uh, fucks up anyone who tries to touch her. Anyone who touches <laughs> her is immediately like, it looks like they're electrocuted. Yeah, they're yeah, yeah. electrocuted. <laughs> it looks like um, she's like a yeah jellyfish kind of style. <laughs> it's like immediately gets yeah. like stung and electrocuted when they touch her. It doesn't look fun. No, it does not. <laughs> um, and essentially, she, for reasons uh, that the player shall learn over the course of the game, has uh, come down from Rena to Dana and wants to dis- bring destruction to this social order and, and society that's been in place for so long um, by taking down each of the five Renan lords um, who are uh, on the planet of Dana and each of these five lands uh, that you must fight through uh, and obtain uh, astral energy containing master cores that each of them holds uh, with the Mm -hmm. intent of ultimately bringing down this whole system. So Ooh. all that being said, <laughs> just a just a tidy little narrative, <laughs> a little narrative bundle for you. Um, oh, and of course, there's the friends you make along the way as, oh, on course. this adventure. Um, you really round out your party of fighters. Um, you know, mm-hmm. you've got long range magic users. You've got 
uh, melee sword fighting. You've got uh, support arts. Um, you've got sort of a heavyweight shield user. And so a big part of the game is also fighting uh, mm-hmm. and really <laughs> mashing it up on the battlefield. But we yeah. can get into that. What What are your first impressions of the game, Ben, Jamie? Yeah, so uh, we talked about playing this game before the break. And I think I actually picked it up first mm-hmm. and was talking to you about it and kind of convinced you that you and you like were like, OK, I'm going to get that, too. And yeah, then we'll we'll play this because we were both kind of itching for like a long media experience to play over the holidays. And uh, it just feels like JRPG time. I don't know. Yeah. I, I played Persona 5 Royal and then and then went straight from that into uh, 13 Sentinels last year around this time. Oh, of year. Yeah. And so I guess this is now my now's my time to play the long games. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so we, we both jumped into Tales of Arise and then over the break, I like immediately fell off of it. I got through, uh, because yeah, pretty, pretty much the, the game, uh, at least to the point that I'm in, it's kind of pretty straightforwardly walking you through each of the realms. You go into yeah. a realm, there's something, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's rote because every realm has its own, uh, for one thing, each realm is very visually distinct in terms of the flora and fauna and even mm. the, the climate. The first realm that you're in, Calaglia, is all fire and desert and rocks. And the next realm that you go into is like completely snow covered and it's always mm. night. So each realm is visually distinct. Um, each realm has its own politics going on that you have to learn a bit about and figure out who you want to kind of side with, who are going to be your allies as you go in to overtake the Lords. But essentially I had, I had worked my way through one and a half of the realms and I just kind of, the, the combat was fine, but I wasn't Mm. fully understanding it yet. I was feeling a little bored by the combat. I liked the narrative, but it just, I don't know over the break, I'd put like 18, 15 to 18 hours into it. And I was just kind of like, eh, So I went on, I played something else for most of the break instead. And then we hung out for new year's and you were like, Oh my God, have you been playing tales? It's all I've been playing. I've been I'm spending so much time. In. I've yeah. been playing so much time and you got me like excited to play it again. So I went back to it and I got into the third realm. And pretty much as soon as I got into the third realm, the narrative of the third realm instantly hooked me. And like, I'm mm. in, I'm sold. I'm right around the 30 hour mark. Now I think I'm about, uh, somewhere between half and two thirds of the way through the game, uh, based on our conversations, probably closer to two thirds ish. Yeah. And but there's still there's still a hefty chunk left to go. But I'm in. I'm in. I'm finishing Tales of Arise. I really like the usually a story of epic proportions like this is not necessarily my bag Mm. not necessarily my bag at least not for this style of of gameplay i don't mind an epic narrative if i'm like really enjoying the minute to minute gameplay i have come around more on the combat but it's still it's just not this style of of jrpg combat is not necessarily my favorite i i actually would either prefer something that i feel like i have total control over it that's Mm. like just a straightforward i'm controlling one character hack and slash Mm. and i don't have to manage other things or totally like turn-based where i'm managing everything love the time that a a (laughs) turn-based gives you (laughs) yeah this is something in between yeah where it's way more complex than just a standard hack and slash but everything's happening at once in real time and you kind of have to you like like this is the type of game where you go in and you set a strategy for the other members of your party Mm -hmm. to instruct how they will work and you can swap characters during battle but you don't necessarily have to um yeah i don't know it's it's a lot for me personally to admit like i just don't i didn't grow up playing these kinds of games i don't have like an innate skill set for playing them Mm -hmm. and so i do find that i i struggle a bit with combat and so what i end up doing is just playing one character which is not necessarily the way the combat's meant to be played i do think you're supposed to be hopping around through the different characters and using their different powers and abilities and and tailoring it more to the enemies that you're fighting, but like that gets overwhelming for me. So then I just stick with one character and then it gets a little boring and rote because the game does, you know, I think anyone who's played a JRPG knows that grinding is definitely a part of it. You have to go into very similar fights with basic enemies over and over and over again to get XP, to level up your characters so that you can go fight the boss at the end. 
And I don't think that this game is as bad as others that I've played mm. in that vein. Like you can, I've been consistently under leveled. And I think if you're within two to three levels of the fight, you should be able to get through it. Like kind of brute force your way through it. If you mm. have enough items, like healing items and stuff like that. But I don't know. The combat's just not my favorite part of the game. I really like the narrative. I'm really here for the characters. I would maybe like this more if it was just an anime <laughs> that I could watch. Mm. It is um, very, that's actually, just when you mentioned that, it is very much like a playable anime. I think yeah. that could be if people want a sense of how much cutscenes play into the There's progression a lot of, of cutscenes. The game. There's a lot of cutscenes. Um, yeah. And the but I'm here for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I think down to the how that's reflected in the art style, like it feels uh, like an anime coming to life. Like, There's almost this watercolor quality when you get really close into the details of like the folds of cloth and the way um, uh, color is used and um, the shapes. It, it has this like 2D, 3D effect that I find really uh, cool. Like it, it's, it's beautiful. It looks almost paint, hand painted at times. Yeah, no, I think the entire art style of the game is very cool. The The art style that plays out when you're actually in control of the character, I think, is it's one of the best looking that I've seen yeah. in a game like this. Like, very, very pretty. All the different worlds. Such a cool style. I actually like that and the the style that they use when you go into, like, dialogues. They have, mm -hmm. um, there's lots of, gosh, they what call are they, them they call skits. them? They call them skits. That's what they call them, which are like, it's not a full cut scene. It's not like a fully animated cut scene, but it's a, a moment where you're having an in-depth conversation with the character. And just to be clear, this is not the type of game where you make dialogue decisions. Like mm -hmm. this is telling you a story, the characters and who they are is preset. You're not getting to like influence the world. So it is a lot more like watching a show and anime than it is like getting to influence the world. But they, the skits, the way those play out is they they give these like almost comic book panels that appear on the screen and yeah. the characters are moving within the panels, but it's limited movement. So essentially it's, it's a way of being able to add a lot more narrative content to the game without asking the programmers to fully design all of these. I mean, cause there are, I mean, there's a trophy for seeing over 300 skits, I think. Mm. I, if I'm remembering correctly, that I saw there was a trophy for that. And I think I read that there's like 330 or 350 skits in the game wow. entirely. So the idea of like animators actually doing all of those and there's full voice acting for all mm -hmm. of those too, which is so impressive because this game, obviously it comes out in Japanese and then the version that we were playing is in English. So that you're fully English voice acted. Yeah. Um, really the amount of work that goes into something like this is just whoa, kind of mind boggling. When I you think about it. I feel like the skits um, and the way that it, that, that dynamic panel usage that you're talking about, it, allows the conversations and these cutscenes to have so much more emotion and sort of nuance than sort of just watching two character models like standing across from each other and talking. Like, oh, yeah. It's like you're really honing in on the like micro expressions and the, you know, the thoughts racing across someone's face. Like I just feel like I'm so much closer to like the emotional beats of the characters than in more traditional like cinematic cutscenes. Yeah, I think the voice acting is really important too, yeah. um, because they do have other times where you'll approach characters to talk to them and you'll just get text blocks on the screen. Mm -hmm. And I, I know we've talked before about, you know, sometimes that's a lot of games have to use text on the screen as opposed to voice acting because of a budgetary constraint. But voice acting does add to the game and the characterization. If, if you have talented voice actors doing those performances, it absolutely adds another layer. And I think that's been crucial to the investment in the characters over this very long complex narrative mm. um but but yeah the the narratively art wise I, i'm like i'm all in i the combat is not it wouldn't be like my first choice it's not like my favorite type of combat but it's mm -hmm. like i'm willing to do that to get through the narrative because i think especially as you go deeper and deeper into the game um, there's just, there's a lot of mysteries to uncover. There's the mystery of, of who our, our main character, the man in the iron mask really is, what his backstory is, why he doesn't remember his past. Um, there's a lot to uncover around Chion and w what are the thorns? Why is she pursuing this endeavor? Mm -hmm. and, and then I think there's just so much thematically that the game starts to pull apart around this idea of 
particularly him being a previously enslaved Dan and man and her being a Renan and, and how they learn to work together, how the world perceives them kind of everywhere they go. Um, Shion's, you know, they're primarily interacting with Danans because they're trying to overthrow the Lord. So they're, they're going in and they're linking up with, um, Danan resistance Mm -hmm. folks in the various lands and Shion is immediately distrusted. So the relationship that her and the man in the iron mask build together is, is really interesting and how she, she at first is very much like very insistent that I'm not doing this for you. I'm not doing this to save the Danans. This isn't something I'm doing out of the goodness of my heart. I'm not going to tell you the real reason behind my motivations, but all you need to know is like, this is personal. This is for me. And like, I'm not doing this to help anyone. I'm not a good person. Like she's really adamant about that. And I think the way they kind of chip away at her and, and mm-hmm. that wall that she's built up around herself is really interesting. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. You, you say more about what, <laughs> what you're liking. Cause this, there's so much thematically going on in this game about just, just society and race, mm-hmm. even though all of the characters are pretty much exclusively light skinned, but mm. the race of the Danans versus the Renans. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. So much there, I guess to continue <laughs> that one thread you were on about Xion, like I think the interactions between the party members, um, I think the, because there are so many skits, there are so many conversations that happen over the course of the game. And I thought that um, there's just this really great through line of sort of, being aware, like having these Renans and Danans coming together and working together in the same party. Um, there's a sense of like unpacking, uh, you know, essentially privilege, like Renans sort of sitting mm-hmm. with what they've been told about Danans and about their position over them and how they should be acting towards each other and, and sort of unpacking, like, where did that come from? Why did we internalize that? And also we're, we're learning things about each other that prove that these, you know, prejudices, prejudices that have been instilled in us are not even true. Um, I think it's tricky because like, I think the game sort of, I mean, there's a line that Alfin says at a point in the game when talking about, um, you know, the Dan and people have been in this, uh, they've been oppressed for 300 years um, by Mm -hmm. this society that far uh, outpaces them in terms of advancement. Like they really have no hope of fighting back. Um, And there's a lot of rage there. And there's this part, understandably, and there's this point in the game where Alfin, you know, as they're sort of understanding that like, uh, you know, Renans have oppressed Dana, but individual Renans can be good. Like that's a thing. Cause obviously mm-hmm. we're you, two of you are in our party and we're your friends. Like, like, um, like your party becomes a mix of both peoples. And there's this thing of like, Oh, not all Renans are bad. Like, um, R- Alfin said, Alfin, the man in the mask, uh, his name is in the trailer. So <laughs> I hope that's not like a big spoiler. Um, he says something like, it's not about, uh, Renans or Danans, like at the end of the day, all evil comes from the acts of one individual. And at that mm. point, I was kind of like, mm. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like I'm following you in the in the world of this uh, epic RPG, where I'm sure at some point we will fight. Basically, you know, I feel like when you think about Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, it's like kind of like mm-hmm. big, there's always a Persona series. It's like yeah. you eventually fight God and that's like basically what an <laughs> RPG is, is making friends and fighting God and preserving <laughs> the people you love. And so I, I feel like we're we're ramping up towards that um, at some point. And so, yes, in this world where everything can be tied up with a neat bow, like, yes, all evil can, can stem from one person. Um, I just think that this game is doing a lot narratively to kind of unpack, um, you know, stereotypes, racism, privilege, class differences, the ways that group think and, and like people can, how societies can be manipulated and, uh, and how like, uh, circumstances of your birth shouldn't affect how you're treated in, in the world. And like, I don't think anyone could play a tales game and not come away with it sort of thinking about, um, well, I mean, I guess some people, I guess racists can, but I, I just feel like uh, any, like anyone who plays this, these games with an open mind, it's like a pretty strong message of like anti-racism and like unity. I think some, I think if, I mean, maybe it's hard for me to remove myself 
putting it as an American in an American context. Yeah, like I do yeah. think things like racism and oppression, like you can't like I don't think saying to these Danans, like, oh, there's no, you can set aside your rage because at the end of the day, we're all people. So like, there's no reason to be mad. It's like, no, there's still a reason to be mad. And like, even though there are good Renans, doesn't mean that like, um, we can explain away rate, like, like like racism as like just being an an individual action. Like, like there's a, (laughs) so so there's like things like that, that I, I think the game has given, like, it's, it's got me very actively thinking. And so I think for mm-hmm. anyone playing this game, I think um, the way that it it's serving high camp, like the game is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. like it's like almost like fringy at times. Yeah, almost too. Cringe. Like you're just <laughs> laughing at the, at the anime <laughs> earnestness of it all. Yeah. Well, um, and Elfin in particular, right? Like yeah. that's sim- the simplicity of that statement that he makes there and like him coming to whatever what feels like a vast realization for him. <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah. I think that line is very particular to him. And I don't know if the game as a whole, if that's like its thesis statement mm. um, of like this clear line of good versus evil. And mm-hmm. in the middle, we're all just humans. Right. I think I think that the game is making like a much more complex statement. And that's kind of like Alfin's boiling down of it because of his simplicity. I'm sorry, though. I cut you off. No, no, I, I think it's, it's like, like there's a lot of, there's a lot here to parse. Um, and so I think that that's one of the things I've been really enjoying about the game is um, like, I think without, without necessarily sitting you down and being like, um, you know, this is a metaphor for how the world <laughs> can work. Like, yeah. like, I just think it, it, it includes these threads with that, while also being utterly ridiculous and over the top and incredibly fun. And so I really appreciate it for that. Um, and I think too, that for people who say like, oh, you know, we can't talk about politics in games. We can't bring race into games. Like, I think that um, this proves like this game in a lot of ways um, makes space for um like you know there's a character who joins your team and he's a renin he's not just a renin but he's very powerful um and is used to having this very pro position where he even talks about how even the clothes he wore people would pick out for him and dress him like he never mm-hmm. really had to do anything to take care of himself and he's coming in uh, and joining your team full of people who have lived you know on the sc- you know, skirts of society, either in hiding or who have been enslaved and oppressed um, and have lived their lives feeling very powerless under this regime. And he, um, you know, there's a scene where the the characters in your party come across um, this person who has died and it's Dan and custom to burn the bodies of those who have passed. Um, and this person who has recently joined your team is appalled. He's shocked. And he replies with this sort of uh, like indignatious, indig- in, uh, indignant outrage uh-huh. and says <laughs> like, how could you burn this body? It's so disrespectful. Like, why not give a proper burial? Like, why not have your family and friends around and, and make it be ceremonious and do all these things? And one of your members of your party just snaps and uh, she turns to him and is like, you know, our people have been oppressed for hundreds of years. We've had nowhere to bury our dead. We've had our entire culture erased. We don't even know what our burial rites are. Like, mm. we don't, we have nothing. Like, all mm-hmm. of their uh, culture has been essentially ethnically cleansed by the Renans. Mm-hmm. Um, and so burning their bodies, uh, it was the best way to ensure that the body was disposed of in a safe way that wasn't spreading disease, while also, like, not leaving uh, a burial site that could be disturbed and uh, destroyed by the Renans. Um, mm-hmm. And this, you know, this conversation happens, and the character who joins your team eventually is like, you know you shouldn't have had to to tell me that, but thank you. Um, And as a Renan who is very interested in Danian culture, he's had moments where um, he's expressed interest in certain artifacts or art and had the Danans on his team being like, you know, to you, that's like an idle interest, but to us, this is like our, our, our culture that's been taken from us. And so having this character go like these conversations, like, 
they could be skipped, honestly. Like these all happen in these skits that um, mm-hmm. you sort of opt into witnessing. Um, but the way that it makes space, t- like like talking about ethnic cleansing in mm-hmm. us in a game that also has like magical dresses and flaming swords, like it, <laughs> like it just yeah. it's it's really doing it all in, in a way that I, I like. I feel like as a younger person, it would be really important for me to play a game like this mm-hmm. and and see that not where it's being um, you know taught to me in a class or like that still should be happening. But I think too, like having other spaces where you can sort of process these kinds of ideas and understand um, in applications that um, are also places for play. Like, I, I just think it it's just a really cool way of sort of like helping people understand these gaps of, of privilege and experience that can be really difficult to talk about all the time and direct to like conversation, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I like I, I agree with you one hundred percent, and I, I think these these conversations that the game makes space for between the Danans and the Renans, particularly in the party, um, and, and particularly like the introduction of the Renan character that you're referencing, um, was was a real point for me where I, I really started to get hooked into the game because I think they they just open up space for I mean, he is he is a character who has very good intentions and yet is perpetually like stepping in it <laughs> basically mm-hmm. with his Dan and counterparts and the fact that they actually make space for them to have conversations with him and not, it's not just, it's not just, okay, now we're going to take a moment to educate yes. the privileged run. And like they have emotions about yes. it. They get pissed at him. Um, he gets irritated at them sometimes for mm-hmm. being like corrected in the ways that he's being corrected or for them get coming at him like, well, what, how was I supposed to, I, mm-hmm. I just think it's very nuanced and very uh, relatable. Mm-hmm. I, I just think it's so rare to see a, a a game of all things actually make space for a conversation about these topics. And it's definitely like narratively what has what has really hooked hooked me into the game. I just I love that that they've made that space for that. And all of the characters, each of the Danans, each of the Renans in the party, they come from very distinct backgrounds and the way they make space for all of that to intersect across the culture and the history of this landscape is is super interesting and there's so many parallels that you can find to mm-hmm. yeah us sitting here playing this in America I, yeah I, I don't know it, it's just kind of kind of mind boggling because even these renans in the part like you're introduced to renans who are friendly and hospitable towards danans and yet they still make space for that to feel off in the yeah. way that like i don't know it just reminded me of like very liberal white folks who are mm-hmm. like i'm not racist mm-hmm. i just think it's so impressive what those people of color have managed to accomplish immigrants are so hard working like mm-hmm. it, it all kind of rings of like smacks of that mm-hmm. mentality and they make space for that to be like ooh, yeah that's a little that's not cringy okay. too it's yeah. not okay like you're still not seeing these folks as people yes and how do we bridge that gap of actually seeing each other as as humans and getting past all of they're not past but like processing all of this traumatic history that we've gone through and i think the game is also where i'm at in it i feel like it's starting to make space for or at least in the conversations that the renans and the danans and the party are having together we're also starting to talk a little bit about like how the system that the Renans have put in place is damaging to the Renans too, mm-hmm. which I think is really inter- like just talking about how this corruption of the power that they have been seeking is like harmful to everyone. I, I don't know. It's it very and- much smacks in me of like like that colonizer and white supremacy culture and how these things are are damaging to all of us, even while they create privilege for certain people. And how do we try to unpack and work through that and and process all of our collective trauma while still holding space for being oppressors and, and privileged and, oh yeah, it's, it's fascinating stuff. Yeah. I, I completely agree about the, how the, setup is damaging to the Renans too and the pursuit of power as well as uh like later they specifically reference like the way that our society covets order and a hierarchy the way that we have this unmovable hierarchy where people are put into castes 
essentially based on how much power they're capable of wielding. Like, this unquestioning authority that we've been taught to instill in ourselves and each other is bad for us. And I, I, and that really, I think, drove home for me, like, oh my gosh, they're talking about white supremacy, or they, at mm-hmm. least they could be. <laughs> um, yeah. And that, I, I love that as well. Like it, it, yes. Um, I think um, one thing that I've also been sort of mulling when I think about this game is, you know, as you mentioned earlier, pretty much 90% of uh, your party and then like 75% of the people you see out in the world are light skinned. Um, Mm -hmm. And a lot of the media coverage I was reading about Tales of Arise, um, these American media coverage, um, people were commenting on like, you know, how could they be telling this story about race and these, this oppression and conflict and all of these characters are white. And I thought that was interesting because, um, you know, this is a Japanese, uh, RPG and it, the game, mm-hmm. all the Tales of series, Bandai Namco originates in Japan. Um, and there is this idea, I think, in a lot of Western consumption of anime that characters are white because they don't have what people would in our in our culture, so expect non white people. They have features that they wouldn't expect non white people to have. And um, there was actually an article in the Atlantic that I was reading earlier today. I mean, it's it's a, a bit dated. It's from 2010, um, and it was uh, talking about this blogger Julian Abagond. Um, is a New Yorker, self identifies as a middle class West Indian, and is also a computer programmer. And this is someone who um, has done a bunch of writing about games. And he has a piece on his blog where he talks about how the notion that anime characters look white is an American opinion and not a Japanese one. Um, he talks about how if I draw a stick figure, most Americans will assume that it is a white man because to them it is the quote default human being. Mm-hmm. For them to think it is a woman, I have to add a dress or long hair. Um, for other racial features, I have to add something that would indicate to a white person that they are not white. The mm. other has to be marked. If there are no stereotyped markings of otherness, then whiteness is assumed. Americans apply this thinking to Japanese drawings. But to Japanese people, the default human being is Japanese. So they feel no need to make their characters, quote unquote, look Asian. They just Mm -hmm. have to make them look like people. And everyone in Japan will assume they are Japanese, no matter how improbable their physical appearance. You see the same thing in America. After all, why do people think that Marge Simpson is white? Look at her skin. It is yellow. Look at her hair. It is a blue afro. But the default human being thing is so strong that lacking other clear stereotype signs of being either black or Asian, she defaults to white. So I just think, you know, it's like, there's, I don't know that I have an answer there because Mm -hmm. like, obviously we shouldn't be making all cartoon characters uh, like, like there should be a diversity of body types and facial Mm -hmm. features and skin um, I absolutely agree. Um, mm-hmm. Otherwise, it, we just further fall into having these exaggerated, stereotypical depictions of anyone who's like not white in like animated cartoon um, mediums. Uh, at the same time, I think that looking at Tales of Arise and saying like, oh, this is all about white people might not be fully inclusive of the context in which it was created and also the ways in which anime is depicted by and for a largely Japanese audience. So I just really think keeping this stuff in mind um, really just adds another layer to sort of interpreting and enjoying this game and taking from it all that it has to offer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm definitely like, you know, I'm not trying to say that there's nothing to be changed or to continue to grow within how anime is made and how characters are depicted. I'm not at all saying that it's okay that for the large part, we only see like one skin tone Mm -hmm. in a lot of anime depictions. Um, But I just think that in the effort of continuing to unpack, you know, how we think about whiteness when we're looking at media and consuming things and centering whiteness and, and actively decentering it. Like I think that, it's useful for that to think about um, the context in which things are made. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I just think uh, 
this game gives me a lot to think about, which I appreciate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, go play Tales of Arise. I mean, granted, you need like 100 hours. So maybe read a summary <laughs> if you don't get it. No, I don't think you actually need 100. How long to beat says this game is 40 hours on okay, average? That's like some speedrunner shit. I don't but even. I just. <laughs> that's like you're not yeah. watching any cutscenes or taking away any of the deeper. Like. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, we're really liking it. We'll probably have an update for y'all in a couple yeah. of weeks when we finish it. Um, with kind of our final seal of approval. But right now, this is a good one. Yeah. Um, and, and just really it's it's nice to to see a game just trying to do just trying to do so much. And I think for the most part doing it really successfully. We'll see how it all wraps up in the end. Um, but I'm really appreciative of the conversations that the game is kind of holding space for yeah. amongst the characters. All right, time to transition. Uh, today, we are chatting it up with guest Lindsay Rollins. Lindsay is a visual artist and a member of the three-person Ontario-based indie game studio Rocket Adrift, where she writes, programs, and does character art, as well as co-hosts the team's podcast, Dark Future Dice, with her creative partners. We had a chill pre-holiday chat with Lindsay about starting Rocket Adrift, making visual novels, and the magic of telling coming-of-age stories. We also talked a lot about Twilight. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We had such a good time with Lindsay, and I'm sure you all will too. So without further ado, here's our interview with Lindsay Rollins. Hello to our wonderful guests, and thank you so much for joining us uh, in the Virtual Pixel Therapy Studio. To start, can you share your name and your pronouns? Yeah, I'm Lindsay, she, her. And Lindsay, can you tell us a little bit about how you spend your time? Um, When I'm not playing video games, <laughs> which is almost <laughs> always, uh, I, I get into fitness. I'm into cooking. I do a lot of home cooking. And uh, I do a lot of, I listen to a lot of podcasts, other podcasts mm. and music as well. Mm. So, yeah. And uh, what are you playing right now? Um, I'm ob- actually obsessed with this like visual novel life sim called Growing Up. Oh. <laughs> it's like mm. basically boyhood, but with stats. And I'm like, oh, okay. Love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta put that on the list. Nice. Yeah. Oh, wait, so what's the goal of the, it's a visual novel, right? So yeah. like, what's yeah. the kind of, I'm just curious about the stats. Like, are you trying to mm-hmm. become the best I'm yeah. growing up. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, like they, they have like a bunch of life skills that are like statistics, oh, okay. like empathy and like physique and then like memory and uh, intelligence. And then there's like uh, another one, charm, right? Hmm. Charm. And if you level up these base stats and they all kind of uh, go towards like schooling, like, oh, if you take lessons in like biology, that's raising your empathy level. But then mm. there's also like side interests that you can have like you can get into cooking or you could get into like um fabricating or like um magic there was like this one storyline i played through was like get into magic and i'm like this is so wild <laughs> wow, it's it like, sounds like persona without the demon fighting yeah, in your brain <laughs> yeah there's no there's no combat at all it's nice. all pretty like it's just like it's kind of also a dating sim so like you once you get into high school you can like start dating other characters and then it determines who you end up with at the end and yeah oh, this I sounds like it. deep i need to check this <laughs> yeah, out yeah there's like a lot going on there i was surprised i wasn't expecting it but it's a pretty big the end <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so Lindsay, do you consider yourself to be a gamer um I, it depends on <laughs> like how people define gamer because like if people think gamer means like Fortnite, then no, <laughs> like, no. But it, if they define it as like you're really into uh, into weird nerd niche culture of like of gaming, then sure. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. What brings you to games? Why do you game? Um, I think it's a good way to escape a lot of the time and i i'm very inspired by going into different worlds and and becoming a different character um Mm. and sometimes it's just like fantasy fulfillment like if i'm playing sims 4 for example i'm just like oh i can just like make the biggest mansion with like everything i ever wanted in it and it's like (laughs) this this great fantasy it really got me through the first lockdown (laughs) 
mm-hmm. <laughs> Sims. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, for the most part, it's just, yeah, it's inspiring. There's no other media like it, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's it seems to bleed out of its form. Like, I, mm-hmm. I, I feel like it it touches on so many levels and it can feel so real um Mm. or not real in a in a literal sense but real in the sense that like it becomes a part of you because you're experiencing it you're not just you're not reading Mm -hmm. it on a page or when you're watching a film you know that's someone else's sort of viewpoint and perspective Mm -hmm. that you're taking and and even how they've edited it is sort of like how you take it in how you experience it is still on a certain track i feel like in a game even if the overarching narrative is the same for everyone playing, mm-hmm. there's still a different approach everyone is taking to it. And that can make for just really unique experiences with the game. Yeah. And so, Lindsay, you know, um, you are also, in addition to someone who plays a lot of games, um, you are someone who makes games as well as mm-hmm. a writer and programmer and primary character artist with Rocket Adrift, which is mm-hmm. an indie game studio based in Toronto. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about Rocket Adrift. Uh, what makes it unique? Yeah. So the th- weird thing about Rocket Adrift is it was it didn't start off as like a game development studio. It started as mm. like kind of an animation project between mm. like myself, Rowan, and Titus. And we started uh, like back in 2016, 2017, I want to say, with like youtube animated web series <laughs> mm-hmm. um and like I, I i don't know if you're aware but like the youtube algorithm is garbage so mm-hmm. <laughs> like it really didn't do much for us um and we ended up putting so much work into these series that like basically a hundred people would view mm-hmm. per video so it was just kind of like i don't know uh we we just didn't see a future in that so but we knew we had all these skills built up, like animation skills and like um, acting. We did some voice acting and writing primarily mm. and like design. And so we were like, why don't we just, we teach ourselves a simple coding language and then we just get into games. And that mm-hmm. made the most sense for us uh, to pivot to that. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I think what makes us unique is that we're just three people that like met in college and <laughs> still like each other <laughs> for <laughs> everything we did together. <laughs> Absolutely. And as an artist, I think, um, you know, both of Rocket Adrift's games, there's Order of Pizza, mm-hmm. which is a visual novel. Mm-hmm. And um, Raptor Boyfriend, which came out in October of this year and is more of like a dating sim, sort of cinematic um, adventure, choose your own adventure type of game. Mm-hmm. And as the artist, primary artist behind these characters, um, like what was important to you when defining the visual style of Rocket Adrift's games? I think um, uh, approaching both these projects, we wanted to try and get a more like... Um, like we had been working a lot uh in terms of like what we could do in the time we were given so we had to really simplify a lot of our character designs before mm-hmm. but for like visual novels we wanted to have a distinct like look because we knew we had also done our research like we played a bunch of the most popular ones mm-hmm. and a lot of them are usually anime schoolgirl style mm-hmm. uh like work and so we wanted to have more of a western look to it more of like a comic book feel to it Mm -hmm. almost so that was kind of what was on our minds when we started designing the characters yeah um and it was also really important that like rowan is the background designer as well so we had to work really closely together to come up with like a style that worked together um i find in a lot of visual novels the concept or the character artist and the background artist are completely separate entities like Mm -hmm. maybe they just commissioned two different artists or they use like a resource pack for backgrounds so sometimes it doesn't really meld really well together Mm -hmm. so we were really interested in having those styles really work together as well absolutely and what feelings do you want to evoke in people who pick up rocket adrift games um I think we have a kind of philosophy that's like make them laugh make them cry (laughs) like basically like we want to sell them on this like idea of absurdity 
and humor and then kind of like make them realize, oh, I really care about this raptor (laughs) 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 and really feel for them at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And speaking of raptors, so I want to focus in on that game a little bit. So Mm -hmm. Raptor Boyfriend is a high school romance set in the 90s where -hmm. you play as socially anxious teenager Stella, uh, who moves to the fictional Canadian town of Ladle and gets to date basically various hot cryptids. Uh, There's a velociraptor, uh, a Bigfoot person, and a fairy. Mm -hmm. Um, How would you kind of classify the vibes of this game? So <laughs> we we were so close to it for so long we just couldn't define it. Yeah. <laughs> and then we we're, <laughs> were just like I don't know is it funny even I, I don't know. <laughs> but then eventually like people start playing it and leaving reviews and people would describe it as like wow the, you really get a sense of like this Canadian rural kind of thing and mm. like really coming of age kind of tone. And then mm. we were like, that's good. That's definitely what we were going for when we started the project. So I guess we were <laughs> successful there. But yeah, I'm never aware of like how Canadian we come off to other people until like mm. Americans are like, wow, that was really like Canadian. <laughs> oh my God, do you have an example of something that's just quintessentially rural Canadian? Um, bike or like trail ripping, as we call it, which is just like, um, it, uh, what's it called? Dirt biking. Like out in the forest. Yeah, that's like a big Ontario small town thing to do for some reason. I don't do it. I've never done it. But like, you know, everyone I know grown up with has done it. So that's funny. I've I've moved to a I live in Western Massachusetts. So we're Mm. about eight hours south of Montreal. And um, something that I've noticed is that so my neighbor across the street from me, for example, there's nary a house for miles like I, I can see like to from my front yard, but I can't, mm. they're not, we're not like within the th- rocks throw of each other. Um, but mm. my neighbor has a very intricate dirt bike trail that he carved out of his uh, backyard oh and he's, he brings out the bikes pretty much every weekend and he's just back there tearing it up. There's like jumps, oh there's like lo- piles of logs and stuff that he like maneuvers around. Um, and it's something that <laughs> I just, I feel like I've been witnessing more and more myself having uh, moved, recently moved uh, to a more rural area from uh, more city setting um mm-hmm. so now i'm like okay it's it's a thing it's like a forest rural dwelling mm-hmm. it's a thing <laughs> it's a very dangerous thing <laughs> so probably, have no interest to try <laughs> yeah it's, it's it's giving me um like i don't know if anyone's seen a twilight new moon but when bella attempts <laughs> to yeah. try and recreate what it's like to be with edward she hops on a dirt bike and almost dies and so <laughs> That's like my main frame of reference. <laughs> to tie everything back to Twilight. Well, it's perfect because this game started as like a parody of Twilight. So. Oh my god! Yes. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm so glad I'm nailing the vibes right now. I yeah. love this. <laughs> I guess I want to, uh, you know, as the character designer again for Raptor Boyfriend, I think it's mm. uh, there's these really iconic like heartthrobs that you've created. Um, and where did you kind of where did you start with that? Like what kind of what were you envisioning as you sort of created the romantic heroes and heroines of this story? Yeah, so that's perfectly ties into the, the Twilight parody thing, because yes. we were like, uh, what if? Edward was like an actual literal monster. Like, <laughs> like he's so easy to fall in love with. He's just a sparkly hot mm-hmm. guy. So like, w- what if he was an actual monster? And then we we're like, what if he was like a dinosaur? <laughs> Like, uh, <laughs> just like, I don't know why we went there, but we did. <laughs> and we were just like, that would be so funny. And then we started developing an idea for a parody for like YouTube initially. And, mm. but then obviously we had to make the decision to pivot. Uh, to game development. So we're like, okay, this is going to be a game now. Um, and yeah, uh, Taylor is supposed to be Taylor Lautner, <laughs> but he's uh, Taylor Talto. Robert is Robert Raptorson, but it's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> based on wow, Robert. How Patterson. did I miss that? Amazing. 
Yeah, and then Stella is supposed to be Bella. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And so it initially started with the, just those three as the lo- classic love triangle. But then mm. we were like, well, we, we want something with Day. Um, and we didn't. We, she initially started as this dumb joke where she was like second fiddle. So her name was Sikande or something. Oh, my God. <laughs> we're like, why do no, it was so, We didn't go with that idea, mm-hmm. obviously, but. Uh, yeah, and so we wanted. We also wanted to include Day, and and I think that's when we started to really uh, create our own narrative and not just be a parody of something else. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's kind of the idea behind all the love interests. Mm. At what point did you feel like it became important for the team to sort of pivot away from just being a parody and trying to create something um, that went beyond that? I think it was around. Mm, it's hard to say now. It's like all fuzzy in my brain, but. Around a year into development, we were like, okay, this has to be like something more than just a parody because we're putting so much work into this Mm -hmm. and we want it to do well. But we also like, we can't help but like really get invested in the writing of stuff. Like we always approach Mm -hmm. things writing first. Mm -hmm. So once we started to really um, develop the characters and the narrative, we were like, okay, it's time to like make this something more like something special than Mm -hmm. just the gimmick game. Absolutely. I think too, like dating sims are this really exciting genre to create within because Mm. there's something about a dating sim that's like instantly familiar and almost comforting. Like you kind of know what you're getting into mechanic wise. And then there's the, like, I think a lot of people can relate to, you know, falling in love and, and, Mm. and uh, meeting people. Like it seems like something that is in a lot, in a lot of ways, or can be very almost universally attractive. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, because people are coming in with these expectations of what a dating sim is, it's, there's really interesting ways that you can totally subvert that and flip it Mm -hmm. in a way that makes it feel like super new, but still really approachable. Um, I was just wondering if any of that resonates and, and what excites you particularly about making something like a dating sim. Yeah, that was initially um, why we decided to even make a dating sim because we were like, we were playing through a bunch and we were just like, oh, it's like very by the numbers, I find Mm. the most popular ones. It was like, there's always this whiny guy protagonist that doesn't (laughs) want to be ravished by a bunch of hot anime girls for some reason. (laughs) And then like this weird kind of like, uh, like reality bending thing that allows it to happen. And then like, eventually he gets worn down by the love interests and we were just kind of like we want first of all we want to put female protagonists at the front uh here because like this is a really underserved part of like the visual novel community Mm -hmm. but also we were like uh what if we made the romance like not as gamified because like Mm -hmm. usually it's about oh you remember the thing that they said and then like you do it so many times and then you get their ending. But for us, we wanted to kind of put more emphasis on like getting to know the characters and caring about them and helping them work through their issues rather than just like remembering things so that you Mm. get their heart meter up or whatever, Mm -hmm. how heart counters. Um, So in that way, we wanted to approach it from a more like emotionally emotional place than just like statistics place. Totally. And I think too, um, I mean, I I think it very much succeeds at approaching relationships other than from a statistical place. Um, This was a game that a lot of folks really resonated with. There was one critic uh, writing for Uppercut, Ty Mm. Galley's Row, Mm. who referred to Raptor Boyfriend as the coming of age that I wish that I had. And Mm. I was curious uh, when when you were working on it, um, the kind of stories and the teen dramas going on was a lot of that true to some of your own experiences or was it maybe more of an imagining of you know um what it could be Mm. what was what you wished you had (laughs) yeah it was kind of both like um so all three of us uh contribute to the writing um but most of that that kind of like drama and experience um like dating experience in high school like i never dated anyone in high school mm. um i was too shy mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah um rowan and titus had definitely had those kinds of experiences so i think they really brought that part to the writing um and yeah a lot of it a lot of it is like like a lot of those small town stuff came from rowan's side because rowan grew up in like 
Kettle Bee, Ontario, which is like basically mm. like ladle. <laughs> I mean, Kettle Bee, it says ladle, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Again, ladle is like a play on forks. Um, oh, color. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> All respect. All roads lead back to Twilight. <laughs> But yeah, they, awesome. yeah, they definitely brought more. Um, I think I was writing from a perspective of, yeah, this is what I wanted from high mm-hmm. school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so funny. Like, um, I don't know. I I definitely was someone who wasn't. I had like maybe a boyfriend near mm-hmm. the end of high school, um, but that that those kind of torrid affairs with all the love triangles and mm. i'm like i didn't have time for any of that i was just trying to pass math like exactly <laughs> uh, i don't know this is something so perpetually like like even now those kinds of stories of like i, I think you know i talked to my cousins who are in high school now and um mm. i mean their high school experiences aren't that much different from what i was going through but there's something that just is continuously engaging about these stories that I guess maybe capture that, that feeling of just being that age and when Mm. any fantasy felt possible and the whole world Mm. was just about to open up before you, um, that makes for really emotionally rich storytelling. (laughs) Yeah. It's that like coming of age that like really inspires me in a lot of ways. It's just Mm. like, ah, these are all the pitfalls, but then look at all the opportunities. Look at like, you could become anything basically. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do we like, I guess visual novels help us adults retain that uh, truth that you can become anything at any time. There's no time where you, you can, you can stop changing. Like if you want to keep yourself open, um, that's still possible. It's still possible to feel things like you did mm-hmm. when you were 17. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. It keeps me on my toes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, so speaking of visual novels that keep us on our toes, uh, so on this show, we love to ask folks to talk to us about a game that had an impact on their life in some way. Uh, You brought up Doki Doki Literature Club. Um, So Mm -hmm. for folks who may not remember, I think we did have an episode where we talked about this because I played it earlier this year and was completely lost my mind, but came out in 2017, (laughs) Team Salvato, and it is a visual novel about a high school group of girls who uh, are in a in a literature club where they read novels and talk about them. And as the protagonist, um, your best friend pushes you to join this club and chaos ensues. Um, so for you, Lindsay, uh, if you were sort of breaking down this game in a few sentences to someone who had never heard of it, how would you sort of talk about Doki Doki Literature Club? Mm. So it is... It, what, uh, from the outside, it looks like your average everyday visual novel dating sim, schoolgirl fantasy type thing. Um, but if you dig a little deeper, it'll, it's going to like turn everything upside down, basically. <laughs> it's not what you expect at all. Um, Absolutely. I went in blind. Um, mm. like it was while we were doing a research phase, kind of. So it was like the perfect time to like play it. But mm. yeah, like Titus had initially played it and then he was just like, okay, you, you two have to play this game. And mm. we're like, why? It just looks like every other dating sim. He's like, no, no, trust me, just play it. And we were just like, okay. And, and then the night me and Rowan played it, we were like, oh, oh God, <laughs> like we're too afraid to even like go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> just like, oh my God. I wasn't expecting that at all. But yeah, that's, basically the first time a visual novel or i guess really any video game did that to me um Mm. so that's what that one came to mind i was just like this is wild like Mm -hmm. i never knew video games could do this um Mm -hmm. it was also just like i didn't know visual novels in particular could do this so that's Mm. what made us think okay we can like do some meta modern stuff that they're doing here in our Mm -hmm. game Absolutely. Yeah, there's something really powerful about, um, like, I guess we get really comfortable 
with the border that separates the player from the game. Mm. And we think when we pick up a game, because uh, we can tell from the title or the artwork or the genre that it was in when we downloaded it, that we know what we're getting into. I was thinking a lot about um, Inscription that came out uh, just a few weeks ago, a mm. like a deck building game that also sort of um, completely subverts your expectation and reminds you that you are not in control. Like, uh, yes, mm -hmm. you are playing this game and you can stop at any time. But when you are playing, uh, you are a, a guest in this world that was built without you and exists without you and ha may have its own rules. And so I think Doki Doki Literature Club, I'm just remembering the ways in which the cracks started to appear. Yeah. Like you, I started to realize um, I was... You know, you're, and I think the, it lulls you into a false sense of security because you yeah. get like an hour in or so before you start to realize, like, yeah, Wait a exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the I mean, first you, rift, yeah, it's like, yes. is it broken? Like, did I break it or something? Is this intended? <laughs> I love, I love that. I love when a game makes you think, like, did I? Is this? Was this? I think too because of how. um how games are created, there's a, there's a, a collaborative nature to them. There's an open source nature where you feel like if you see the code, you can sort of understand what's going on. Or if you, like, mm. uh, like, I just think that um, because it's an art form that's relatively malleable and, and also can take pieces from each other and maybe um, like you, you can see through lines in other games from, from other games that you've played. And, mm. and so I think all of that works together to just like, it feels like permeable in a way mm. that other forms of media do not, mm. which also adds to the sort of like mystery and magic of, of games that sort of subvert expectations in that way. It, it reminds me of just like being a kid and, and feeling like, games were these absolutely awesome unfathomable i mean they still are <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's still like a lot of it becoming a game developer i was i've just kind of seen beyond the veil on a lot yeah. of things it's like a lot of can be achieved with like this really simple line of code that's mm. already available in most engines it's just like how you use that in a creative way but it was mm -hmm. like, yeah, when I was, before I was a game dev, I was like, how are they doing this? Yes. Like, <laughs> what? It's like magic. <laughs> Absolutely. How do you think playing Doki Doki Literature Club changed your approach to making games? Uh, it definitely made us think uh, in ways that are like, ho like, how do we flip people's expectations on their head? Um, we, it, we, I don't know, actually. I no, I don't think Order of Pizza. We we hadn't or, um, released Order of Pizza before we played Doki Doki. So, okay, I was going to ask about that. Yeah, I played it this yeah. morning, and it it felt like there were um, lots of really interesting connections. Mm -hmm. So I was curious, yeah. like, um, if you could talk a little bit about Order of Pizza and mm -hmm. um, what the team was was looking to create there. Yeah, so it was basically like we had just heard of Nano Reno like a month ahead, and we were mm -hmm. like still in the middle of like pre-production for Raptor Boyfriend, and so we're like, okay, maybe we'll just make the small game for this game jam, and as a kind of test to see that that we can make visual mm -hmm. novels at all because <laughs> mm -hmm. we hadn't even started with the code yet. So it was a good crash course, definitely to learn RenPy, which is the language we use to make both those games mm. um and it was basically just a concept we had to come up with in a week because we were like you know a month like to get this done yeah so yeah we were a lot of it was inspired directly by doki doki because we were like well that game inspires us and we want to kind of do something similar anyway um and so we might as well just do it in order of pizza so with the order mm -hmm. of pizza it was like a time loop you were stuck in this like time loop that you aren't fully aware of until like maybe halfway through your playthrough. Um, and the other characters are completely not unaware of. Mm -hmm. So in that way, I think it was very similar to Doki Doki. And just for a little context, uh, folks at home, order of pizza is a really awesome game that everyone <laughs> should play. It's, uh, if it's choose, it's pay what you can on itch.io. 
Um, you can pay, I mean, you can pay nothing if, if mm-hmm. that's what you're, what you're able to provide at this time and, or you can pay whatever you want. Um, and it's about 30 minutes. I think folks can get through it in about 30 minutes. Um, and you are a father who is divorced and you have a teenage, uh, child and, uh, you also have a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And so you think to yourself, I know the best way to get my child and my new girlfriend or not new, my girlfriend that I've been dating for quite a while to meet um, on the weekend when I'm supposed to be taking care of my child, I'm going to invite my (laughs) girlfriend over and Mm -hmm. force them to interact over pizza. And what ensues is um, what you think is a pizza topping making game, like essentially, (laughs) um, you know, you're in a room. Uh, you're, you're facing your, uh, child and your girlfriend on there sitting on couches across the room from you. Everything is very awkward and stilted because your child is sort of pissed that this has been thrust onto what's typically their pizza night with dad. And mm-hmm. your girlfriend on the other hand is sort of like, why did you put me into this situation? But I'm going <laughs> to yeah. do my best to be a supportive partner and a positive role model for <laughs> your child. Oh God, he doesn't deserve her, honestly. <laughs> And what ensues is, I mean, I think, listen, people, I'm not afraid to say it. Order a pizza did 12 minutes better than 12 minutes did. Um, Oh, my God. Okay. That's (laughs) interesting that you say that because Ty Galise Rowe had also reviewed Order a Pizza when it came out. And they said we did... um, uh, what was it? God of War better than God yeah. of War. <laughs> Whoa. It was like the biggest compliment I had ever received in my life. I was like, Ty. Oh my yes. God. And I think, yeah, Ty made a really great point. I did read that piece and I think uh, for, for folks, um, definitely check out Uppercut for um, really great, um, you know, games critic insights. But what Ty mm. wrote was essentially that, you know, in games like God of War, um, we all know that Kratos is a terrible dad. Um, but in lieu of actually, you know, taking steps to move forward or actually reconcile with his son, the game sort of builds you up to a moment where Kratos is able to finally place his hand on Atreus's shoulder and show affection to him near the end of the mm. game. Um, but sort of really leaves all of the, okay, but like, am I going to have to kill you? Is this what you, yeah. like, are sons supposed to kill their fathers? Like, are we, like, there's no resolution, really. There's just sort mm. of like, okay, Kratos finally has a feeling like yeah the year. and so I know. Um, <laughs> you know in a, in a lot of these games that are largely written and driven by white men um mm-hmm. there's not really a lot of nuance in sort of how we talk about what accountability looks like as a father mm-hmm. um and so in order of pizza uh, a game that really folks need to just play to understand how it's relatable to both God of War and Twelve Minutes. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound like it, but trust it us. Sound like it, but that's the magic of Order of Pizza, people. For, so for like, I mean, a few dollars, this is really the bargain game of the year that you've been waiting for. Um, but, uh, you know, just the way that it allows for more of that. What does it look like? What does healing look like? What does changing look like? Like what does um, sitting with these uncomfortable feelings of failure, maybe what does that look like? Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, for a game that you put together for a game jam, I'm sort of blown away. Like it, it was really hitting. Um, Everyone should play order a pizza. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Awesome. Well, Lindsay, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Um, where can folks follow your work and keep up with what you're doing? Sure. Um, I, we're on Twitter. Uh, if you want to follow Rocket Adrift, it's just at Rocket Adrift on Twitter. Um, I also have my personal Twitter, uh, Lynn, at Lynn Rocket Adrift. Um, I don't post much there, but when I do, I'll post some art that I do that's not related to game dev. Mm. Um, and that's about it right now. <laughs> Is there anything uh, post Raptor boyfriend that's going to be happening anytime soon? Oh, we've already started prototyping our next <laughs> game. <laughs> yeah, we have a really tight deadline that we got to reach before the holidays, actually. So, oh shit! <laughs> Is there any anything at all you can tell us about it? Yeah, sure. It's going to be a horror game. Uh, nice. It's, it's going to be a pixel side scroller. So we're <gasps> kind of deviating away from visual novels a bit. Oh, cool. Um, learning game maker as we go. <laughs> it's nice. been interesting but yeah and it's gonna be 
it's going to have all the feels that you could come to expect from our other works, maybe more in, in line with the tone of Order of Pizza, though, than mm. uh, Raptor Boyfriend. I'm curious, like, when when you think of horror, like, what's the kind of horror game that you want to make? Because I feel like it's it's tough. Like, Doki Doki mm. Literature Club was, like, the first horror game that I picked up and I was like, this mm-hmm. is the kind of horror that I want to play. I'm exactly. not trying to get gored out. I'm not trying yeah. to throw up. I'm not trying to re-traumatize myself. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to have my expectations completely subverted to the point of unsettle being unsettled. Mm-hmm. And I want to question everything that I know about games. And I want to like psychological horror. Like that's mm-hmm. what I'm looking for. And so I'm curious uh, what kind of horror you like. <laughs> that's exactly the same for me. Like we again we were doing a bunch of research around Halloween because we were in the mm. spirit mood <laughs> and we were playing a bunch of horror kind of like um like indie horror games on Steam mm. and Edge and a lot of them was about like being chased by a monster or like twitch kind of controls or hiding mm-hmm. and running and I was just like I don't I don't find this compelling. <laughs> like Mm-mm. as soon as you've seen the monster and then it starts chasing you it's like and then you have to like retry over and over again because you will die the first time it happens Mm -hmm. it's kind of loses its like effectiveness as a monster so we definitely want to approach it from more of like an emotional or or like a psychological point of view where the the player is kind of confused as to what's happening or like there are hints as to something bigger or more more emotionally there than just like a monster or like gore or something Mm. Mm. Uh, we want to go more like a psychedelic route. Like we saw a lot of Ooh. psychedelic kind of imagery and, and like sh- TV and movies that we like horror TV and movies that we like. So mm-hmm. yeah, we're, we're trying to draw a lot from like haunting of Hill house or yes. yeah. Or like uh maniac. I don't know if you've seen maniac, mm. but that one is absolutely fantastic. Okay, look that one it's up. not really horror. <laughs> it's more just kind of like drama, but okay. it has a lot of like kind of, unsettling like mental illness kind of stuff that we're like Mm. hmm we might want to like delve into that kind of theme Mm -hmm. so yeah awesome well can't wait gonna be keeping eyes on rocket and drift (laughs) lindsay thank you so much for joining us on pixel therapy yeah thank you for having me up for today's session of pixel therapy thank you for tuning in and we hope that listening to our thoughts and feelings gave you some thoughts and feelings of your own if you want more pixel therapy come check us out at patreon.com slash pixel therapy pod where you can snag that monthly bonus episode for just two dollars a month plus get opportunities to get involved with the community and influence the show directly if you're not up for contributing monetarily but you enjoyed this episode you can show your support for free by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts and following us on Twitter and Instagram at Pixel Therapy Pod. That stuff is just as important and we appreciate it just as much. Remember that Pixel Therapy is a happy member of the But Why Though Podcast Network, so you can support us by supporting them and head on over to butwhythoughpodcast.com. That's though with a T-H-O. Take a peek at the inclusive geek community they're building around pop culture news, reviews, and kick-ass podcasts like yours truly. And you can keep up with all of this stuff and more by visiting our website at pixeltherapypod.com. Finally, since we like to put our money and our energy where our mouth is, we end every episode with a recommended side quest. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for recommending this week's side quest. It's Games Making Games based out of Toronto. DMG is a not-for-profit video game arts organization that creates space for marginalized creators to make play, and critique video games within a cultural context. They teach computing skills for artistic expression, offer production and exhibition facilities, and provide community support for the creation of new artworks. Their space and community is a platform and playground for artists working in games, engaging the public with the expressive potential of this medium. You can learn more and donate, get involved. Check it out if you're in Toronto at dmg.to. Thank you for that side quest, Spencer. That is our show for today. So go forth, run a story mission, level up some stats, and don't forget to hug an NPC every now and then. We'll be back soon with some more Pixel Pixel Therapy. therapy. Bye-bye.